<laughs> seminar, but we're very pleased to have Dr. Lindsay Reynolds with us. You probably, most of you know her, she's a postdoc in our department. Unfortunately, she's going off to another postdoc at Brown University, but she has been very central to the Index in the Human program. In fact, a key instigator and tireless worker on this project. So we really benefit enormously from, from her stay as a postdoc, and we hope to continue that relationship further because she will continue being associated with the Index in the Human program. I talk up. Oh, you may yeah. It's also, I think, key recognition to uh, Lindsay for her contribution that we also much arrived in the department. Uh, she fulfilled really uh, a role of uh, lecturer, of uh, academic leader, uh, also around the development of the new. Uh, postgraduate program in health and development that we as a department will offer next year. So there will be time to say uh, when do we see you again and we hope that it's soon but just uh, also to say from the department side uh, thank you very very much uh, for your key role in major initiatives like this department. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> even a very good introduction. So uh, before, before I kind of um, step into the, the paper itself, I, I wanted to just take a moment to kind of um, uh, give a bit of an orientation to how, how this, this particular piece of work fits in the kind of larger questions that, that I've been thinking about for a while um, and that tie to kind of broader thematics that uh, others amongst us in the next human group or in the department um, have been thinking about. So, so I guess my, my sort of general orientation to, to this project and to some other pieces of work that I'm doing has been uh, to think to think uh, in a more general sense about the ways in which uh, people are sorted and stratified in global health research um, and interventions and in other uh, complementary disciplines or approaches to the world. So to think about this question of classification and to, to ask questions about the ways in which um, definitions and categories uh, and the kinds of local social processes that they aim to encode um, can shape uh, the production of scientific knowledge, um, can shape the effectiveness of interventions, and can really shape people's everyday lives. Um, and uh, people's everyday lives can also reshape, reshape these processes of knowledge production. Um, and I, I'm particularly interested in the kinds of uh, social and ethical implications uh, of the ways in which social, what we might call social categories, um, are defined and engaged in these kinds of contexts. Um, so, so my work is really aimed to think comparatively about the ways in which categories of population, community, kin, and family, amongst others, uh, are constructed in different research and intervention programs across uh, sites in South Africa. Um, and to think about these kinds of ethical and social questions that emerge from, from these categories. Um, so my, my previous work took up this question by thinking about the category of the vulnerable child and the ways in which uh, ideas of orphanhood and of vulnerability, um, which encode within them assumptions about how families function and about how children are raised and about kind of processes of care in the everyday, um, how those categories are taken up in the context of uh, primarily, the, the kind of case I drew out in my doctoral research was focused on uh, U.S. HIV/AIDS funding in South Africa and the ways that uh, sort of bilateral aid programs imagined families to function in post-apartheid South Africa and the tensions between those kind of imagined constructions of family forms and post-lived realities. Um, and moving from that that project, which was uh, Focus on families um, doing ethnographic work with individual families in one locality, um, which happens to be the site uh, that I'm going to talk about a bit later in the paper, but it happens to be a site of uh, large scale um, global health research, um, long term longitudinal research and clinical trials. Um, so, in the context of that site, working there and getting to know children and families, I became increasingly interested in the ways in which global health research more specifically uh, comes to think about 
categories like family, like kin, like community. Um, and my postdoctoral research, which is what I'm talking about here, has focused more explicitly on um, on that research insti institute uh, and others, and thinking about how um, global health research programs think about about these categories. Whereas the previous work focused a bit more on um, sort of development and health interventions and the way they engage with families. Um, so the kind of the broad, broader problematic, I guess, that that motivates this work for me is is this real tension where in order to function, uh, both global health research and interventions need to organize the world into categories necessary for all kinds of interventions for governmental um, programs. There's a, there's a need to kind of organize the world into categories to decide who gets services and who doesn't, who are the most needy population. These kinds of um, categorizations are very necessary. Um, but, but there's this sort of constant process through which everyday social life resists these kinds of easy uh, reifications or categorizations. There's always this kind of play between the need to create categories and to, to sort of structure those and the kind of complexities of everyday life. And, and my work has really tried to uh, work in between that or work that tension in, in different ways. Um, so I, I like the um, Lawrence Cohen talks about the idea of, of concepts being made operable, that they, uh, that they must, even complicated notions have to be created in a way or structured in a way that they can be used, <coughs> that they can be um, used for, for interventions, they can be used by people in their everyday lives. Um, so I'm really interested in this process. How does, a, how does a very complex social category become something that is operable, something that can be used in, in global health intervention, in a research program, in a, in a sort of state project? So I'm going to leave it there and, and kind of dive into the paper for today. Um, but we can talk more about these broader conceptual questions at the end if you guys want. So, Anthropologists have long been concerned with the formation of fundamental units of social organization, not least among these, the notion of community, understood variously as an aggregation of shared interests, exchange relationships, ritual practice, geographic proximity, and political authority. As Jane Geyer has described, debates regarding the use of, house, of the terms household and community in place, for example, of notions of kinship and lineage, represent a major tension within the discipline of anthropology <coughs> and between disciplines regarding how we understand the place of local social structures in broader conceptions of state power, of capitalism, of modernization. These are really big debates. At the same time, however, <coughs> as anthropologists and social researchers, we often define our own research fields and think about our own ethical obligations in terms of conceptions of community at multiple spatial, temporal, and effective scales. This has been particularly true of anthropological research in Africa and in what we now refer to more broadly as the Global South. Ethnographic writing and diverse representational practices by scholar advocates have been instrumental to the production of flexible and fungible concepts of community as the term has been used increasingly by development practitioners, anti-globalization activists, and corporate actors and scholars in other disciplines. So a lot of people use this term in different ways. More recently, the term has gained a particular valence in the practice of global public health. In brief, community-based approaches to health promotion and service delivery first emerged as a, as a major discourse in the 1960s and were formalized in the language of community participation in the 1978 Declaration of Alma-Ata, which is a very important moment in, in the history of public health, following a broader shift towards a neoliberal development paradigm in the late 1980s, new governmental forms have been instantiated through moral economies of responsabilization and community ownership. So the same term community gets used, but for very different kinds of um, political agendas with quite different stakes behind them. So the work I'm currently conducting asks how this fundamental yet problematic unit of anthropological theory and ethnographic praxis has been taken up, transformed, deployed, and contested in contemporary spheres of global public health. As a label and a category, community is simultaneously empty and full. It persistently defies efforts at strict definition, yet carries considerable moral authority and is handily deployed to signal a political orientation 
or ethical commitment on the part of a policymaker, a practitioner, a scientist. Normative and remote romanticized notions of community circulate with little attention to the consequences of their invocations for political or pragmatic ends in public health. To try to open up some space for critical engagements with such concepts, the aim of my work is to explore how such seemingly simple notions deployed with increasing frequency in health research and intervention can serve to stabilize what we might come to see as a series of complex and shifting processes and potentially to, to obscure quite powerful tensions in the ways in which individuals and collectives are engaged and understood in the context of global health and development. So in this presentation, I will offer a very preliminary exploration of the ways in which the concept of community is constructed and enacted in sites of biomedical research and intervention in South Africa. And I should pause here to say that this is, this is research I'm currently doing. So, so my conclusions here are necessarily tentative. I'm, I'm giving guys a sense of the, the kinds of questions I'm exploring, and I'll give you a bit, bit of ethnographic material, but this is in no way a kind of finished project. Um, more specifically, the paper examines how the concept is deployed in the conduct of two large-scale population-based trials of a new biomedical approach to HIV prevention, often referred to as treatment as prevention. While the protocols and procedures of the trials are divergent, both engage centrally with concepts of community in their research design and practice, as I will describe. The concept of community deployed in the design of these two cluster randomized trials, and I'm going to talk about that notion in a moment, and in their use of related notions such as community engagement, community consent, community acceptability, among others, hinge on quite particular notions of and engagements with practices of relatedness, belonging, and meaning making in each of these sites. Tracing how such concepts are enacted is essential to understanding the scientific results generated by such research and intervention programs, ethical implications, and their long-term effects. So, so to kind of break it down a bit more, um, I really see that these kinds of, the way in which social categories like community um, are defined is important across kind of three different levels. First, there's a real concern about the ways in which these social categories and the ways they're defined shape the actual studies and interventions, uh, their success and their, their results. Um, so statistically, will these studies have power? Will they, will they show what they intend to show? And I'm, I'll describe a bit more why that, why that is the case. Uh, practically, will the studies actually be able to recruit and retain participants? Uh, will they engage communities properly, uh, depending on how they define that, that, that idea? Um, so that's one level, the kind of practical level of, of the, the aims of these studies and these programs themselves. Uh, there's a level, another level which is maybe about what we might call real-world effectiveness. Uh, in addition to shaping how individuals and populations are randomized, these concepts could be potentially quite central to the success or failure of these kinds of interventions, of things like HIV treatment as prevention interventions in, in implementation in the world. Um, as many scholars have pointed out, what often get referred to as biomedical approaches to HIV prevention, in fact rely quite heavily on a series of individual behaviors that much research has shown are socially conditioned, whatever we mean by that term. Despite a clear acknowledgement of the central importance of community mobilization and community engagement uh, to the implementation of treatment as prevention, and more broadly in the HIV prevention world, we know that these concepts like mobilization are really important. Uh, such activities are often described by my work in quite instrumental terms as a necessary component of recruitment activities and of ethical procedures rather than as central to the outcomes of such interventions themselves. And then a kind of third, a third, at a third level, uh, I think that these, these categories and the way that concepts like community are defined is, is important because they can really shape and reshape social life um, and thus can have quite important ethical implications. So who one chooses to include and exclude from a particular community, depending on how that concept is defined, uh, and who is chosen to represent its interests, have important ramifications for people in areas where research and programs are rolled out. Um, so just kind of as, as I talk, we can think of across these different levels as I move between them a bit in, in my in the paper. So to open up these kinds of questions, uh, the, the piece that I'll present to you here in the, in the time that I have briefly describes how, how these two trials, um, 
understand and deploy concepts of community in their protocols, operating procedures, and other official documents. Uh, and then I then attempt to, to offer a, a quite brief elucidation of the kinds of tensions um, in how this contested in how this contested concept is experienced in everyday practice emerged in one site of one of these two sites, which is a site of long-term global health research, um, through describing one particular social situation I participated in. And through focusing particularly on this one site, uh, my work aims to, to explicate the specific ways in which concepts of community have been produced historically within specific locations um, in apartheid South Africa and then now in post-apartheid South Africa. So nearly 30 years into the HIV epidemic in South Africa, the impact of HIV AIDS and other diseases and the research and interventions they have mobilized have reconfigured many elements of social life for a large number of South Africans. In northeastern KwaZulu Natal, where much of my research has been based for the last decade, nearly every family has been affected by both the long-term social consequences of the epidemic and by the ongoing research activities of major transnational programs that have been formed to measure and address its effects. At this moment, however, much seems to be shifting as approaches to HIV prevention and care have become increasingly biomedical and as large populations are surveyed, tested, and enrolled in complex and costly medical regimes. For many health researchers, the shift to such intensive biomedical approaches represents a transformative moment in knowledge production and public health responses to disease in Africa. As large populations are enrolled in complex and costly medical regimes in order to attempt to prevent the spread of disease. However, as I've said before, uh, many scholars have pointed out that these kinds of biomedical notions actually do rely heavily on uh, behaviors that are that are socially conditioned. So that this this language of, of this being a new moment for of purely biomedical interventions is a language we could we could interrogate a bit more. Um, so, so those behaviors, for example, are things like HIV testing, clinic attendance, uh, treatment initiation, drug adherence, right? Um, so as these new approaches are rolled out, shifting social relations are produced and imagined around the conduct of health research and the distribution of drug and care services. In this context, the broad, broader research project from which this piece is drawn examines how categories of population, community, kin, and family constructed in the conduct of these two large-scale trials of a new biomedical approach to HIV prevention, which is often shorthanded as treatment as prevention. So the project thus aims to explore the differing social dynamics, scientific processes, and ethical dilemmas that shape the conduct of global health research and intervention. And, and through that, I, I aim to think a bit more about the kinds of layers of, of relatedness um, of authority and the kinds of everyday intimacies that are created between uh, created by engagements between these two different sites of global health research and intervention and the communities in which they are based. In order to explore these concerns, uh, my work asks a series of questions. As I said more broadly, how, how are people sorted and stratified for the purpose of these particular projects? Um, what assumptions are made about the functioning of kinship and relatedness in such contexts? Uh, how are perceptions of community, kinship, health, well-being, risk, and vulnerability affected by the classificatory processes involved in the trials? Um, what lasting effects will these research programs have on local social relations? That's a kind of question, an unanswered or unanswerable question of this kind of work, I think. And how will, will social processes themselves reshape trial results and the production of forms of medical knowledge? So a bit, a bit about the trials. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. They're quite, they're quite large, complex trials. And if you guys have questions, I can, I can come back to it. Um, but but uh, I'm just going to kind of frame the scientific debate and tell you a bit about the two trials I'm looking at before um, giving you a bit of, of ethnographic material. So despite an emergent international consensus regarding the efficacy of the approach known as treatment as prevention and impending policy changes in South Africa, uh, researchers involved in both of the trials I trace here argue that the current evidence base does not conclusively demonstrate whether antiretroviral therapy, so HIV treatment, delivered at an earlier stage of HIV infection can in fact prevent onward transmission of HIV at the level of populations rather than individuals. So we've had a series of trials that have suggested that, that this approach works at the level of 
couples, but to think about it as a population problem is a very different um, challenge. So to demonstrate this conclusively, they argue it is necessary to conduct these large-scale randomized controlled trials of the approach in what one of the trials says, an appropriate population under real life circumstances. So in public health and medical research, as probably most of us know, uh, randomized controlled trials are widely considered the gold standard for establishing the efficacy of health interventions and have become increasingly powerful in the expanding era of evidence-based medicine and public health. In the context of treatment as prevention, however, the primary outcomes of these trials do not involve individual subjects, but rather involve their sexual contacts and networks, making conventional randomized controlled trials, which rely on individual randomization uh, to either intervention or control arms, uh, and in, in, an ineffective way to evaluate the effectiveness of such interventions. Thus, both of the trials I'm working with uh, are designed as what are called cluster randomized trials, in which groups of people are randomized or randomly selected to receive an intervention. I know this is kind of dry, and many of you guys might be familiar with this, but it's important to understand this background to understand why, why the concept of community matters. So while the units of randomization for such trials are diverse, including clinics, hospitals, schools, and entire areas, by definition, all cluster randomized trials rely on the ability to define and bound groups of individuals into population groups or clusters. In the context of these treatment as prevention trials, the unit randomized is imagined to be and labeled as a community. However, as stated above, the way this concept is understood and deployed in the two trials is quite distinct, in part due to the very different settings where the trials take place. The cluster design aims, as one of the trials put it, to minimize contamination when clusters coincide with predominant sexual networks, which, by which they mean that the effectiveness of this approach of, of HIV treatment as prevention is premised on an assumption that spatially defined clusters, defined in the way that these trials do, represent the sexual networks of individuals residing in those areas. So there's a very important assumption here about how people's social and sexual networks function and the spatiality of those networks, which, as we most of us know, in, in a place like South Africa, is a particularly complicated assumption, given histories of migration and contemporary patterns. Right? So there's a complex story to be told about the ways that communities are defined in the two trials, but I'm just going to move through this quite quickly here. So in brief, uh, the TASP trial, uh, which is a which is a two-arm trial, meaning there's an intervention and control arm, with 22 clusters covering a population of 40,000 people, relied on the results of previous research that defined 159 local areas within one sub-district in KwaZulu-Natal through self-report to conduct those clusters. So they asked people to define their own communities. Um, and so this is a this is this picture shows you the sub-district where the task trial is taking place. So those are all the clinics um, in that, in that sub-district, which is in northeastern Kwasuli Natal. Um, so the clusters were designed to encompass existing social networks and are described as having a distinct social identity. While not specified in the protocol, in practice, local area maps are often overlaid onto maps of traditional authority areas or izigodi, and the izigodi are used to define and bound collections of local areas or clusters. So it's quite a complicated thing they're doing, but they, they ask people to report on their own conceptions of community, and then they've overlaid those reports on um, existing traditional authority area maps. So uh, as I said, this is what I was just describing. Um, so I know these maps are hard to read, but uh, so this, this is a local area map, and the smaller words that you can't read are the terms that people use themselves to define these local areas. Um, and then the, the red circled over it, the red, uh, sorry, red borders are the, um, the different trial clusters. So if you look at that and then you look at a map of traditional authority areas, in which this one, the, the red clusters are overlaid over traditional authority areas, you see sometimes they match and sometimes they don't. Um, but, but it's quite a complicated uh, conception of what communities are and how they play out in this area. So the Popper trial, by contrast, is a three-arm trial, meaning it has two different kinds of interventions uh, and a control arm, uh, with 21 clusters across South Africa and Zambia and an overall population of 1.2 million. So this is a very big trial. Um, 
and it defines its clusters as the catchment populations of government health facilities, corresponding to a population of between 20,000 and 100,000 people, depending on which area you're looking at. So it's a very different conception of, of something like community, even though in the protocol the same word is used. Uh, so just to show you a couple of pictures. Um, so this is one, one catchment area. Uh, which, which this one is pretty uh, maybe spatially distinct because there's uh, empty land around it, um, but they don't all look like that. Um, and these are the 21 clusters, which are uh, in South Africa, all in the Western Cape, but in Zambia, across the whole country. Um, so so uh, in the protocol, the Pavar protocol, the first time the, the word cluster is used in describing the trial design, a parenthesis defines it as a community. And then the word community is used in the rest of the protocol. Um, and I, I think it's important to, to note these kinds of easy slippages between terms and to inquire about the work these kinds of slippages do in shoring up the production of scientific knowledge in such sites. So, so I, I pay attention when I'm, when I'm doing this work to the way people move between these, these kinds of terms quite, quite easily without thinking very much about it. So in the longer ongoing project on which this presentation is based, I'm beginning to explore the ways in which individuals residing within the study areas, particularly right now of one of the trials, understand and engage with concepts of community in their everyday experiences, interrogating if or how the definitions employed by these trial researchers and implemented through the study pro procedures shape and reshape forms of sociality as the trials proceed. These trials are ongoing, so the, the project is going to continue over the life of the trials. Uh, the divergent understandings of community deployed in the creation of study clusters are not restricted to scientific protocols, but are also used to define key procedures and ethical practices across the two sites in ways that may, I suggest, shape lived experiences in important ways. Firstly, both trials highlight the importance of so-called community mobilization and community engagement to the implementation of treatment as prevention. And trial protocols call for community entry, community education, and trial promotion through quite complex strategies of community engagement. And this is a term that gets used more and more in, in global health work. Um, through researchers in both, though researchers in both trials emphasize the central importance of trust and community involvement to the success of the studies, I find it interesting to observe, as I mentioned above, that engagement in both studies is described in largely instrumental terms as a necessary component of recruitment activities and of ethical procedures, rather than as central to the design and outcome of these interventions themselves. So in study documents, descriptions of community engagement procedures fold into ethical concerns with ensuring what is referred to as community consent. In the context of an implementation trial like TAS or PopArt, uh, consent, but particularly for PopArt, consent is expressly not sought from each individual involved in the trial, right? Um, rather, agreement is obtained from communities to take part in the study to an accept, and to accept the results of the random assignment to a study arm. Because, as I explained, the intervention and control arms are, are communities. There's not individual people being randomized within those communities. Um, so the pop-art protocol des describes the concept thus. Uh, it is of the nature of a cluster randomized trial of this kind that entire communities are assigned to one study arm or the other, and individual consent for community allocation is not possible. However, they go on, the term community consent can be misleading. True community consent is only possible if the community has a legitimate political authority. For example, a tribal council that has the authority to make binding decisions on behalf of its members. You have a very important assumption here about, about what a legitimate political authority is and where it might or might not exist in, in a place like contemporary South Africa, which we could talk a bit more about. So the ethical framings and everyday operations of the task trial and the research center where it is based rely quite heavily on this kind of authority. At the start of their work in the area in the early 2000s, center leadership sought the sanction of the local traditional authority, a relationship they have been careful to maintain and grow over the years through transitions in the leadership of both the traditional authority in the area and of the research center itself. In 2011, for example, to strengthen their ties with the traditional authority and to reinforce their position within the area, the center leadership negotiated for the Zulu king, uh, Goodwill Zalatini, to be installed as the official patron of the center, 
organizing a large public ceremony involving the transfer of several head of cattle to formalize the relationship and installing this picture right at the, the entry as you walk into the large research center. So these modes of consent uh, rely on historical forms of patronage that are highly contested in contemporary South African politics, <coughs> as most of us know, um, and in the experiences and opinions of many individuals I've worked with in this locality. In my work, I try to explore the kinds of tensions that can be produced through a reliance on such structures in contemporary health research, and the way that similar notions of patronage are deployed by research participants in their engagements with researchers and what they ask of, of the trial and of the center. And then I'll, I'll come back to this later. By contrast, as pop art researchers have pointed out, the other trial identify legitimate political authority, to use their words, across nine distinct project sites in the Western Cape, not even to mention all the sites in Zambia, it, it's quite a difficult task. So they, they say in their protocol, we will seek consent for community participation from community level stakeholders who will be defined through the community engagement process and who will include local leaders. And not any more about, about who those local leaders are. Uh, because of the perceived lack of clear authority in these sites in the Western Cape, before beginning the trial itself, research staff went through quite a long process of trying to define these key stakeholders and local leaders in each site and then grouping them into health committees, a structure that had been created by the Department of Health and at all the clinics in the area, but which had fallen out of use in most clinics in recent times. So they were actually recreating these committees who then consented on behalf of the, the population where the trials um, unfolded. Uh, so this process of defining and engaging the community and securing community consent took nearly two years, and tensions regarding appointments on the committees and support from often divided forms of authority within the trial sites are an ongoing tension in, in this trial, and one of the real challenges of, of implementation. So in, in ensuring the ethical operations of the trials, researchers also deploy notions of community-level risks and collective benefits. So, Communities may feel disempowered, the pop art protocol describes. And again, these protocols are public documents, so you guys can all, all look at them and, and, uh, if you want a bit more context for these quotes I'm pulling out. But communities may feel disempowered, the pop art protocol describes, by having a research agenda imposed on them. Or they may be placed at risk of stigmatization by the publication or dissemination of research results. Large community research projects may disrupt intra-community social structures and networks that are not always easily understood by an external research team. Elsewhere, the protocol suggests that social networks could rather be enhanced through the trial. Networks of stakeholders that will be created through the implementation of the study interventions, the document states, will not only improve communication between community groups, but will also be a catalyst for reinvigorating social connections that have been threatened in the wake of poverty and HIV AIDS. So to understand the contradiction between these two claims, it is, it is important for us to pause for a moment to think a bit about the ways in which representations of kinship, family, and the social in post-apartheid South Africa have become central sites of contestation between quite powerful discourses of fractured families, custom, and social order, and their reconstituted forms. In much research and many popular sources, the HIV epidemic has been described as undoing that which holds the entire social fabric together. And I'm sure we've all seen these kinds of, um, this kind of rhetoric. It's quite a public narrative. Uh, in other work, scholars have argued that the new era of treatment as prevention, in fact, reveals the importance of the social in these so-called biomedical prevention practices, and have argued that these techniques will, in fact, produce new social forms, experimental societies, as Vin Kim Wen calls them. So given these tensions, these kind of contradictory views, it is clearly essential to think about the ways in which both the epidemic and the research and interventions it has mobilized have shaped and been shaped by a complex and fluid array of social forms, modes of belonging, and techniques of inclusion and exclusion. And I'm going to uh, transition here with the, the time I have left to tell you a bit more about, about um, one of these sites um, to, to begin to explore such tensions. Um, thinking about how, how these concepts of community are deployed in the activities of, of one of these sites, um, the large-scale demographic and health demographic and health surveillance and research center in northeastern Kwazulu-Natal. So since 2000, this research center has conducted 
semi-annual rounds of demographic and health surveillance on a population of approximately 11,000 households. So a smaller population than the population that the, this trial is being enrolled, this trial is enrolling. Further, like many other demographic and health surveillance sites in Africa, and this is an increasing trend, uh, the center has served as the site for a variety of clinical trials and other health research projects and a diverse array of internationally funded intervention programs. This is a heavily researched population. Behind these technologies of research and surveillance lie massive amounts of physical and emotional labor shaped by a complex constellation of patronage, obligation, generosity, and debt. And this is something that uh, Thomas and I have written about elsewhere, but I'm not going to go into too much here. So uh, focusing on one particular encounter between representatives of the center's primary transnational funder, center leadership and staff, and local and regional leaders, I offer a very preliminary exploration of how formal and informal formal processes of community engagement can serve to produce or to stabilize particular fields of relations that make the conduct of health research in these sites continually possible. Um, and, and possibility in this sense, I think, operates across across different registers. The first uh, way we could think about making these uh, this kind of research possible is about a, an instrumental and practical concern with participation, consent, and community buy-in, which is often, as I said, the way that, that this concern is expressed by, by child staff. Um, the second is a broader set of norms regarding what is seen to constitute ethical and just global health research in the post-colony. And this is the concern of ethics boards, but also um, could be thought about as a larger political problem, right? And, and the third, I think, is a is a much more fluid set of concerns related to questions of politics, of power, of patronage, and of, and of the importance of place of, in, in this kind of work. So in this context, I ask, what kinds of figures and figurations of politics, of the social and of the local, are produced through formal processes of community engagement and through the everyday activities of center, center scientists and staff? How do they articulate with longer histories of production and extraction of physical labor, raw materials, and scientific data in this place? How do contemporary forms of capacity building um, or of community engagement uh, or of, of these, in the context of these trials rely on and reproduce, rely on, reproduce, or reinvent structures of power and patronage? Or how do they transcend them if they do? To begin to interrogate such questions, I'm going to offer very briefly here uh, a reading of one particular social situation, to use Max Gluckman's term, in which I participated, that serves to open up maybe in a way some of these tensions in the ways in which individuals and collectives are engaged and understood in the context of, of health research like this. Um, tensions which, as I've said, can be way too easily masked by the kinds of formal and problematized languages of community that are used um, in these contexts. So for those who are familiar with, with Gluckman's work, uh, in one of his most famous pieces, which was published in 1940, he makes an argument for what was then a new ethnographic approach, and it turned to thinking about the macro, historically determined forces that shape social structure and practice, using the description of a series of social situations to describe the broader social structure of, of this region of northeastern Kwasin Nizhal. So social, social situations, he says, are a large part of the raw material of the anthropologist. They are the events he observes, and from them and their interrelationship in a particular society, he abstracts the social structures, relationships, institutions, etc., of that society. By them, and by new situations, he must check the validity of his generalizations. This method was later expanded into the extended case method, um, which, is a, which is an approach that has been quite powerful in in kind of methodological um, conversations in anthropology. And we could talk a bit more. Um, I'm not going to have time now to talk about the kinds of debates and merits around this, this kind of case, extended case method, but it's, it's an important question. Um, so in the piece, Gluckman begins with a detailed accounting of a ceremonial, ceremonial opening of a bridge in Zululand, or northern Kwazulu Natal, in which European officials and area residents participated, as well as Zulu leaders, local people, and bridge laborers. Through an analysis of this scene, Gluckman moves on to describe his understanding of the social structure of this region, shaped particularly by black-white Zulu-European relations. The relations expressed in this situation can be studied, he explains, as social norms, as is shown by the way in which blacks and whites, without constraint, adapt their behavior to one another. 
So in two subsequent essays, he goes on to describe the development of this social structure and its broader ramifications. But in this first, it's very much about just describing what happens. So I don't have time in this in this uh, brief presentation to describe or analyze the social situation I've chosen in nearly the kind of details that Gluckman offers in this piece, um, which is a project I'm, I'm working on. Um, I, I'm simply going to attempt to note some of the kinds of resonances uh, between the scene, the scenes I, I've uh, participated in in this place where I work, and the kinds of social situations that Gluckman describes. Um, particularly this this one social situation, which in, which occurred nearly 80 years earlier uh, than than the time in which the social situation I described, which which occurred last year, um, happened, and but was less than 100 kilometers away from the site where I'm working. Um, it, I do this in order to gesture to some of the methodological, epistemological, and moral concerns that such explorations raise about the ways in which social forms and social relations are imagined, engaged, enacted, reproduced, and transformed in global health research and interventions. So, so um, just a, a brief pause to say a, something a, a bit more about the about the locality in which which my work is based. For those of you who aren't familiar with this this part of South Africa. Um, this this region, which which is sometimes called Zululand, uh, the region of KwaZulu Natal, sort of extending from the Tugela River north to the Mozambique border, um, and, and this region is really still a place filled with contradictions. A place one could say perhaps has two quite conflicting kinds of um, public narratives. Uh, first, portrayed by many scholars as the rural, the hinterlands, the wasteland, the remainder. These are words that different scholars have used. It is seen as perpetually marginal and outside of global processes of social change. Under colonial government and then under the apartheid regime, much of the area served as a labor reserve for the Zulu population. In contemporary post-apartheid South Africa, it continues to suffer the effects of this history of underdevelopment, segregation, and exploitation, and remains one of the poorest areas in the country. Uh, with at least two in five adults uh, unemployed, and probably much more. Uh, in many accounts, it is placed unchanged by democracy, economic progress, and the provision of social services. Two decades after the end of apartheid, the area also faces concurrent epidemics of TB and HIV, with some of the highest documented rates anywhere in the world, uh, high rates of maternal and child mortality, a high burden of injury and violence-related deaths, uh, and juxtaposed epidemics of adult obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and childhood malnutrition. Um, and as I said, currently the area has one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, documented rate of HIV infection in the world, with adult prevalence, age 15 and above, estimated at, a, at about 24%, um, peaking at nearly 60% in women aged 30, 25 to 34 for the highest um, age, the most infected population. Uh, so in the, in, the second, in the second narrative about this region, Zululand exists as a central site of diverse forms of production and, re of, and reproduction, of building a home, raising children, and investing in kin. In contemporary political narratives on traditionalism, uh, the area is often described as a center of custom, of honor, of history. Referred to simply as Amakaya at home by some Zulu speakers, it is seen to be a place of origin, a center of spiritual life for many members of what is often considered to be the largest ethnic group in the country. In times of trouble or of celebration, urban Zulu speakers often return to their symbolic homes in the area, even after several generations of urban life, uh, a process which, which other, anthropolog other South African anthropologists have written about quite beautifully. Uh, the area also holds a unique position in the history of public health experimentation, and this is a history that's quite important for the way that I think about my work in the area now. Uh, dating back to the apartheid era, and more recently in the context of global health research, discovery, and intervention. These include colonial and apartheid era health interventions and experiments, and diverse clinical trials, and more than a decade of demographic and health research conducted by the center where I work and other transnational stakeholders. So in this context, Zululand has also become a key contact zone in global flows of knowledge production in the context of global health research, discovery, and intervention. So I, I just wanted to kind of set, set the scene a little bit for, for this social situation that, that I'm going to describe now in my last minutes very briefly. So in early 2014, I was invited to attend a series of events organized by the center where I work in honor of the visit of the board of one of their primary funders. The events included two days of scientific presentations, clinic visits, and tours, as well as closed meetings to discuss long-term research agendas for both the center 
and for Africa more broadly. There was a lot of conversations in these meetings about what is the scientific research agenda of Africa or for Africa. In addition to the board of the donor organization, several directors of other major research sites in Africa also receiving funding from this major donor attended. Um, at the close of the two days, a dinner was organized for all the visitors at the nicest hotel in the area. The list of invitees was carefully planned to include representation of all the authority figures in the area, and seating arrangements were revised several times to ensure that, that everyone who was invited was seated quite strategically next to those who it was thought would be their, the most important people for them to, to chat to about their work. Um, in the longer paper on which this presentation is, great, is based, uh, drawing on Gluckman's method, uh, I described the unfolding of the evening's events, the conversations, the seating arrangements, etc., in as much detail as I, as I could muster. Here, as my time is limited, let me just highlight a few moments to give a flavor of the event. So the, the event started uh, with quite a long speech um, by, by uh, a representative of the African National Congress talking about uh, Mandela and the history of uh, of South Africa and this post-apartheid moment and, and really praising this research center as being a, a, a very powerful force uh, for good in, in, in South Africa today. Um, and after, after several long speeches from the leadership of the center and other visitors, uh, the representative of the local chief stood up to speak. When you came here, people were dying, he said. The center is our baby and also our father. We will be with you day and night. If you go wrong, we will tell you. If we do the same, please tell us. We will follow you. Even if you want another portion of land, a big one, we will say that. We will say yes. There will be no no, just yes. At my table, I was seated between the chair of the local community advisory board, who had recently returned from a trip to London as part of a program intended to strengthen local community representation and one of the directors of the donor organization. After the speeches, he turned to her and said, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me to come to London as your guest. The last member of my family to visit London was my great grandfather, King Teshwayo. So for those of you who are not familiar with your Zulu kings, Teshwayo, who ruled from 1872 to 1879 during the Anglo-Zulu War, is generally remembered as the last independent king uh, last independent Zulu king, and after famously leading the Zulu nation to victory against the British, uh, his forces were defeated, and he was deposed and exiled to London. Right, so it's a very particular history that he's drawing on there. So the evening closed with a long performance from a traditional Zulu choral group. The group had recently won a competition hosted by the center for their song about the importance of prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, which they performed for the visitors. Uh, dressed in matching white tuxedos rather than the warrior costumes worn by most such groups uh, when performing for tourists in the areas. They performed the song along with many other local standards to a uh, great uh, rounds of applause from, from the audience. At the end of the performance, one of the funders, an elderly British gentleman, stood up. I am so glad, he said, to see that the proud Zulu warriors have risen again. So. In a sense, in this encounter, one could suggest that the research center, or perhaps the forces of knowledge and science it is seen to wield in the area, become in such moments uh, a kind of metaphorical bridge from Gluckman's scene, uh, the reason for people to come together, uh, and a moment in which quite complicated kinds of social tensions and, and power structures get, get played out. Um, and I, I can talk more about that, but I know I'm running out of time. While this scene is certainly exceptional in some ways, um, I could also have chosen other similar moments I've witnessed in my time working uh, in this area. Uh, the ceremony to celebrate the installation of the current Zulu king as patron, which I mentioned before, uh, accompanied by, by quite, an ex quite a complex ceremonial gifting of a head of cattle. Uh, the visit of one of the South African president's wives and several members of cabinet. The installation of the new chief in the area after a long succession battle in which the center is rumored to have played quite an essential role. Uh, the ethical framings and everyday operations of the research center rely quite, quite heavily on the relationships solidified through the kinds of encounters I'm describing here. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, that this, this relationship with traditional authority is something quite important for the center's ongoing operations in the area. 
Uh, in the longer work from which this presentation is drawn, I explore the tensions produced through reliance on such structures in contemporary health research and the ways that similar notions of patronage are deployed by a variety of individuals in their engagements with the research center and in what they ask of the center. Um, just as the center sought the support of the traditional authority to support their ongoing research, organizations and individuals learn to look to the center as a poten potential patron in the area. The language articulated by many I spoke to centered around a desire to be supported, cared for, sheltered by the research center. Uh, it, sorry. As the largest employer in the sub-district, and in fact one of the largest service providers, these strategies are not surprising. Such rhetoric is a far cry, however, from the modern concepts of citizenship and rights often deployed by health researchers and funders in conversations about local community engagement and capacity building. Uh, rather, such relations are framed by quite complex histories of patronage and dependence in this region, structured by what's, what Sheila Marx has famously referred to as the ambiguities of dependence, a point which I take up in, in my writing elsewhere, um, and, and comes out a bit in the, in the piece that I, I uh, circulated for the reading group, for those of you who had a chance to look at it. So my point here is really not to, to construct a kind of simple critique of the neo-colonial nature of such relations, which one can clearly do, right? Uh, but I don't know that it does that much for us to do that, and, and I would be interested to hear from you guys as this is work in progress, um, how you respond to it. Uh, but, but rather, I, I really want to acknowledge the ways in which the continued unfolding of scientific research in such localities is structured by historical inequalities that are not easily righted through simplified concepts of community that are central to conceptions of ethical global health research in such sites. So the aims of, of such activities, of, of activities like community engagement, uh, are purportedly to shift such structures of power. I'm not certain that this is, in fact, their primary effects in such places. To really come to terms with such questions, we need to acknowledge that such processes are not so simple to engage and understand, and to look for new, or maybe not so new, ways to attempt to understand their intimate, everyday dynamics and broader implications tied to the kinds of ambivalent socialities produced through the center's research and engagement and their capacity building activities. Um, and so to, to come back in conclusion very briefly to the place from which I began, which is thinking about, about these sites in the context of these, these ongoing um, very prominent international biomedical prevention trials, uh, I think it's important to think, to, despite being touted as these very innovative forms of biomedical prevention, I think it's it's possible that the success here of these kinds of trials, of new approaches to biomedical pre prevention of HIV, and of health and development interventions more broadly, are often grounded in and deeply influenced by quite complex histories of biomedical research and intervention, and by the long-standing inequalities and vulnerabilities that have shaped the epidemic's particularly powerful impacts in the region. These colonial residues deeply shape the ways that people give meaning to their encounters with contemporary health research and intervention campaigns in the context of the HIV epidemic. Um, but more, more broadly, I think that uh, to understand these kinds of processes, we need to think about the, cons the constitution of communities as complex, fluid, processual, rather than as static entities that can be identified and enumerated in techniques like cluster randomization. And we need to examine the kinds of assumptions that are embedded in such research and interventions, where social processes are simplified and abstracted, are made operable or assimilable in order to produce clear research protocols and significant findings. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, so we'll, we've got more than enough time for discussion, and we'll take three to four questions, comments at a time. Okay. And please introduce yourselves. Uh, so I'm uh, Justin, and I'm a PhD student from Durham University. Um, thanks, that was really great. Um, you kind of already gone over this you know, a little bit as well, but I was just um, interested in, I suppose, how traditional authority were being kind of um, you know, brought into you know, this in the context of the trials. Do you, do you think ultimately that, you know, you've mentioned that the traditional authorities have kind of almost looking up to the center as a, as a means of patronage and, and care and stuff. But you know, also, in what ways do you think that, I suppose, these authorities have been empowered or reinvigorated or affected their 
conceptions of power over their constituents, like almost like they, they seem to have as consensus in this, they seem to have almost a power over life and death since that's what the, the centre itself is, is, is seen to bring. Uh, you know, all things, things for Cody come to mind when, it, when you know, power over life and death come into it. How do you, you know, how do you think that's, you know, has that affected, you know, their conception of their own power? Okay, let's take a couple more. Hi. This is maybe a, a bit of a cheeky you, question. Oh, sorry. I'm, just um, just I'm, yeah, I was going to recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a PhD student at UCT. Um, but, John, I was interested when you, it was such a beautiful image as well, when people were planning the seating, and then I thought, well, I wonder who they put Lindsay next to, and I wonder why. And you did mention, but you mentioned more the relationship between those two people, and I'm wondering whether you could speak about maybe how you think you're seen in the organization, and maybe link to where they, who they made you sit next to. I have I have lots of questions. Yeah, I'm okay, sorry, I'm Joanna. I'm a postdoc in performance. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to try and restrain myself. Um, and following on from Rose's question, I was interested in um, sort of the black box of the research center. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly the focus of of this paper that you've given, but are there sort of, I'm, I'm sure there are, but can you tell us about the kind of competing views or interests in the center in terms of how particular approaches to community are rolled out? So um, does that sort of map against different constituencies or factions within the center? And I was also wondering, if there are research staff, trial research staff within the center who share your analysis or concern, or would this be something that they would really not, that, that people within the center would really not make sense of, the sort of argument that you're making? Which, which part of the center in particular? Um, the, the definition of the Yes, community. yeah. Do they see as problematic the question, I mean, I know that they struggle, they struggle to define community, but in terms of what you're saying is at stake in the way it's being defined and deployed, is that something which is recognized within the center? And if so, does it recognized by who? By which sorts of factions within the center? Thanks. Um, it was very interesting. I was introduced to my parents from this department. Uh, yes. <laughs> I was just going to talk about ethnographic, uh, ethnographic part of the presentation that was really rich. In. But it made me think about, um, and your, your return to Shooter Marks as well, of course, it made me think of Jim Ferguson's work and others that have come out recently. Um, but, but I'm wondering in particular about um, the relationship between the institution and that local politics. And there was a kind of hint at it, you know, they're mobilizing all the chiefs, and um, you suggested that they, they sort of insert themselves into the local, local patronage networks and so on. But I mean, I wonder in, in relation to kind of campaigns that are happening in the country around traditional, around the authority of traditional leaders, how the center sits within those debates. So the Center for Law and Society at BCT, for instance, is has you know, been campaigning quite vigorously uh, on these matters and so many others. Um, so I wonder how this is read. I mean, it, 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 it feels like it's, it's and, how it, and how it sees itself politically. Um, so I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. Yeah. Okay, now it's your turn. Okay. So, uh... So, uh, to, I mean, I think Justin's question and, and Brian's question are kind of uh, related, so I can try to answer the first and the last together, which is, which is really about uh, this relationship between the center and, and different political structures within the area, and, which, which is a really complicated question, uh, and it's something that's changing all the time, which is why this project is, I find, so fascinating, um, to, give, to give one kind of in, instantiation of this, uh, of, of this change. There's been, in the last year, um, a complete transition in the way that the center 
uh, defines the community advisory board, who sits on that board, which is the kind of official uh, sort of voice of the community in the area, right? So the community advisory board, for those of you who aren't familiar with the way that this kind of research happens, is something that seems by most ethics boards to be required for this kind of research to proceed at a, at a basic kind of normative level. And the community advisory board is seen to speak for the community, uh, to protect the community's interests, to make sure that the community is not exploited, that unjust research doesn't happen, um, to, to kind of democratize scientific knowledge production. And there's a lot of debate about how effectively they do that, right? But that's their kind of what they're imagined to do. So they're imagined to represent the, the community in a certain way. Um, so in, in the context of the center where I work, the community advisory board has really always, since the center started in 2000, primarily been structured by the traditional authority. So each uh, sort of uh, sub-chief in Duna in the area would send people forward to sit on the community advisory board, or some members of the traditional authority themselves would sit on the board. Um, and there were also inserted other kinds of key stakeholders, like a representative of, a, of an HIV positive uh, group from the area and others, a traditional healer, um, who represented the kind of traditional healers association, but the, the predominant structure in the community advisory board has always been uh, sort of selected by the traditional authority. Uh, but last year, uh, and we have to, to ask the kind of political question, we have to contextualize this in, in the history of political changes in the last 10 years in the area. But last year, the community advisory board was basically, um, they decided to start a brand new community advisory board. So all the previous members were kind of let go, although some of them have come back on the new community advisory board. And a whole new system uh, was developed for how the community advisory board would be elected. And in that system, which they called, I think, uh, which I find particularly interesting as an American working in South Africa, which they called the Electoral College, um, each each, each Induna and each municipal councillor um, was asked, was told that they could send a certain number of people forward to sit in the electoral college, and then the electoral college from within its ranks elected the community advisory board. So it was intended very explicitly to be an acknowledgement by the center of the fact that there are these kind of two forms of political authority um, now in this area more explicitly than they used to acknowledge, or Maybe they are there more explicitly, and we could debate that, or now the center is acknowledging them more explicitly. Um, and so there's this brand new community advisory board which started this year, um, and there's a lot of debate. Uh, we're doing a series of interviews now with the old community advisory board and the new community advisory board, kind of see how differently they conceive of some of these tensions, and that's, uh, we're just doing those interviews now, so I can't actually <laughs> tell you too much about that yet, um, but that's one of the things I'm really interested in uh, in this project. Uh, in, in terms of the, the broader kind of um, regional politics, as, as I'm sure many of you know, this is an area that was historically in Kata Freedom Party, has shifted to be a more ANC in the new election, in the elections in the last several years, and then a kind of trend in that direction. So the kind of uh, power of the traditional authority as linked to the Nkata Freedom Party is really shifting in this area. Um, the, the local municipal councillors, the ones who elected these CAB members, have now, in, in another kind of confusing part of, of local politics, been, been sacked um, on charge of corruption. And there's a whole new election happening in the area. So the, the municipal councillors that did select the CAB are no longer in office. Um, so now the center sits again with this problem of whether they have to redo their, their community advisory board once again, which I don't think they will do. Um, so these, these kinds of very simple processes, like electing members of a cab, become very politically charged. And there's a sense um, from the center staff and others that I've worked with there that the traditional authority is not very happy with the center in its current uh, in its current moment. And there are a lot of kind of reasons, that pe stories that people tell for why that is. Um, one of the stories, which I think, to come back to the scene, one thing I didn't say as explicitly is that the um, the presence of the ANC representative at the start to be the first voice in the start of this um, of this event was something quite new uh, that hadn't happened before, and that that ANC representative was um, Mark Maharaj, who's quite a high level person who came to to speak um, in this place, and it's there's a some people I've talked to say that like the this is now an ANC kind of Seen and it didn't used to be, um, and that's so. There's quite a lot of, of tension around that um, and uh, di different stories. So it's a very charged scene right now, and um, not one that, that is kind of settled in, in one way or another at all. Um, so I could I could talk 
more about that. Uh, so, so yeah, the center itself, um, uh, the center leadership does like don't the, the sort of scientific staff and um, leadership don't like to talk about these kind of political questions explicitly, but they're certainly talked about a lot um, by all the sort of what sometimes we call the frontline staff, right? The field workers and the community engagement officers and the people who have to negotiate these kinds of tensions um, in their everyday work. Um, and so, okay, that's kind of Justin and Werner's question. Mm -hmm. uh, Rose, I, th I think your question is a really interesting one. My, my place of within the scene, um, the, the direct answer to the question of who I was placed between at this, uh, at this event, well, so I was placed um, sitting next to the director for medical humanities because I'm the only kind of anthropologist type person working that, who was present at this event. Um, so they thought we would be able to talk about things and they, I was kind of explicitly given this mandate of talking up the, the humanities work at the center, which, which isn't a lot of their work, but they know that they, that there's an interest from the funder in doing more of that work. Um, and then on the other side, sitting next to the sort of head of the, the community advisory board because I'm doing research about ethics at the center and they feel like we need to build a stronger relationship. So it was very clearly um, quite an instrumental kind of seating plan and that was true throughout the whole room. And I, I sat with the, the person who was in charge of the seating plan, which they rearranged lots of times, like a kind of wedding, you know, where you're constantly changing the table arrangements to make sure that you don't sit the wrong politicians next to each other. Um, it was quite fascinating to see how that unfolded in, in the context of this, of this particular scene. Uh, but the kind of broader question of how I'm seen within the organization, uh, it's really changed over time depending on the leadership of the center. I think I, I get a lot of freedom in, because I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider. So I've been working there for a long time, but I'm not employed by the center. So I get brought in often to sort of when they need to bolster the humanities and social science program of the center um, in these kinds of moments. But, but I have a lot of freedom to kind of operate outside of their, their normal structures, which is sometimes the the privilege and the, and the burden of the anthropologist, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of sit outside of and inside the scene and how you negotiate that um, that tension. Uh, you know, just to give a kind of another current um, issue <coughs> that I'm dealing with in my role, I've started a, a reading group at the center on social science and ethics search, and we're reading work from a lot of other trial sites in Africa. And then we had our first meeting last week. And the people who came to the meeting, this meeting group, were not the, the kind of scientific staff that you would expect to come to an academic reading group, but they were the, the community engagement officers in front of some of the other kinds of field staff. Uh, and the conversation drawing off of these readings became very much about questions of, of equity and why it is that this international research center operates in the way that it does and why most of the sort of publications are done by the kind of international staff and how it is that the local staff should could get more voice in terms of the scientific agenda of the center. It became a very explicit conversation about about those kinds of tensions, which I which I found really interesting. We'll see how how it unfolds over time, but, but it's quite a quite a charged space. For um, and I, I sometimes get put in that role of, of mediating and then reporting back to the to the center leadership, the kind of discontents of the of certain members of the center staff, um, which is a strange position to be in as an outsider or as an anthropologist, right? Um, Joanna, the, the black box of the research center, um, it, it really varies depending on, on there are, when I work with, with kind of um, as a social researcher and anthropologist, I, I sit between public health and anthropology, I have both trainings, I can kind of speak both languages sometimes, although my, my um, statistical analysis skills leave quite a lot to be lacked, to be uh, are quite lacking, um, but I think uh, there are certain there are certain center staff, and I think it's important to acknowledge that there there are some some people there who are quantitative researchers who are quite astute uh, in their understandings of of the history of this area and in their kind of critical consciousness of of these kinds of politics. When there are others who are not at all interested, I wouldn't say that there's kind of one unifying stance um, of of everyone in the center. There are certainly some people that are that are concerned with these kinds of questions, um, but maybe less at the level of kind of politics and history and more at the, the level of um, normative ethics and practical kind of applied concerns. Um, and then, uh, do you have a second question, Jenna, that I missed? I think that was another one. 
But when you sort of answered it, because you talked about the field workers and the community engagement officers and then the scientific staff and the international mm -hmm. versus local. That's kind of what I was asking. But I don't know if there's any other. We share the same kind of interest in Yes, yeah. And if they share the, this, but I think you, I think you answered yeah. that. Okay, let's, let's go for another round. Comments or questions? I, I, yeah, okay, good. Um, um, I'll do introduce yourself, even though we know you're good. <laughs> okay, I'm Google Ads in the department. Um, when you focus on one particular site, uh, the one that you refer to is over the site. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just got me thinking what type of researchers have been conducted in this area? And how they have impacted in the mm -hmm. community. That, um, people in the area articulate themselves. Are there any overlaps between the type of work that you're doing now and any previous kind of studies in the area? And um, mm -hmm. would there be a particular language that is emerged from these instances that could uh, have transformed the notion of community that um, people in this mm -hmm. setting articulate? Okay, Justin. Um, I was just wondering a bit more about these how these clusters were formed. I mean, um, did I mean uh, I don't know how much scope the um, the SART centre had for choosing clusters, and stuff, but I was wondering how much kind of backroom engineering went into, I suppose, selecting places that looked like clusters in the first place before that. You know, or you know, to, were, were certain areas scrapped in the design, or was there was there any issues like got oh, over oh, oh, um, Things like migration, as you mentioned, might might upset this particular. You know, so the, how much engineering before the fact was was, was done, and before they got people to define their own. I don't know what going on there. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question or comment? Anybody else? Have the right. Right. Yeah. I'm sitting in the chair. <laughs> now, I, I wonder how this differs from big development projects, for example, and what happens around it. So the, the different attempts at capture by political actors, whether it's ruling the parties, traditional leadership aligned with the ruling party. I mean, is, so Ferguson's anti-politics machine, not the Penguin's argument, could be quite useful. <coughs> Again, it's not as if you know the NC has, has this exercise its intentionality around all of this, but yeah. things come together and aggregate around, perhaps it started quite small initially, I don't know, uh, particularly Africa Center, how, how it began, and then roads and clinics and all sorts of things begin to aggregate around it, and the state is very present, which is unlike, um, so it's kind of reinforces or buttresses bureaucrats say, well, that was Ferguson's argument, but it's not initially intended and it's not anticipated and it's a kind of outcome that happens behind the bats of the most powerful. I, I don't know whether I, I buy that argument or whether it works in terms of what you see. Yeah. And then I suppose my next question is, do, do these concepts of uh, coming out of humanitarian studies around different types of citizenship, therapeutic citizenship, Thinking. It doesn't make any sense here, given this is a big state that, in a way, appropriates the the NGO. You know, it's, it's, the NGO doesn't have autonomy. That's why it's constantly got to work with the state. It can't have that sort of autonomy that Ben Kim talks about in West Africa, where the state has no resources to provide treatment in, the, in that period that he's writing about. Any, any other, yeah? John. Um, so I, I have another question about the accountability structures around the center, because I'm interested in the way that these sort of major global public health interventions um, interface with existing um, formal structures of political accountability and decision making. So. You know, I know that in South Africa there are legally, constitutionally mandated um, forums for the governance of health, 
which I'm not sure if that's the health committees that you're referring to or not, but um, what is the relationship between the center and the kinds of structures of decision making? Have they overtaken it? Have they circumvented it? Have they reinforced it through in the way that Stephen was speaking about? Do they undermine it? Sort of what what do you see? Have you found anything out? I mean, I know that's not what you're looking at, but yeah. have you seen anything that might speak to that? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start with the first question, I guess, Google's question. Um, what types of research have been conducted in this area, and how might they have shaped kind of people's conceptions of, of community? Um, is something that I, I haven't gotten into yet in this project um, around this notion, this concept of community explicitly. Uh, but I've looked at this, well, two things to say. One, that, one that pe the, just the idea that this, what, so the center's um, primary operations of, are of demographic and health surveillance, and they're conducted, um, they're conducted in a smaller area than the area that this trial um, is conducted in. And uh, that area, which, if you look at this map when it comes up, so in, if you see in this in this map, the, the larger trial happens um, in the whole subdistrict, so all around here. Uh, but the the primary operations of the center, which have been going since 2000, uh, happen in a smaller area, which is right here. Um, and that area, which has these fixed borders, is called the demographic surveillance area by the center staff. And it has as its southern border a river, as its northern border a river, as its western border, this is the Fifui Mufalozi Park. So this area that you see where there's no population is, is here. Um, and over here, the N2. <coughs> um, and so it has these kind of physical boundaries, but clearly people move across the N2 all the time. And the, they all go shop in Chuba Chuba, which is the town here. And there's a lot of fluidity, but this demographic surveillance area is constantly called a community and is asked to sort of define itself as a community. And a lot of people who live in that area maybe, it, well, a question I guess is how much people see themselves as being a part of this, the Africa Center's community, the people who are in the surveillance area. So these are people who twice a year they have field workers visit their house and every person has a kind of name, a number plate on their house with their, what's called the bounded structure identification number and they know that they're in this system to, in one way or another, right? Versus people who live elsewhere in this area, um, who maybe uh, until until the last few years, the center also um, under PEPFAR, US HIV AIDS funding, was the, the sort of implementing partner of PEPFAR in the area. So they ran the HIV treatment program for the whole subdistrict. And so center staff were at all of the clinics in the area providing HIV treatment. Um, so they have very kind of different communities or different boundaries within the area in, in kind of complicated ways. And uh, how people imagine themselves to be part of the, the center's community is what one kind of um, instantiation of this question, of the kind of effects of the center on the way that people think about, about something like community. Um, the other way that I've thought about this question more broadly around um, social structures and how they how they get shaped by, by this kind of research is, is thinking about the um, demographic and health surveillance, uh, which goes to every bounded structure, as they call them in the area, uh, twice a year and asks very particular kinds of questions, like who lives in this household, who's a, me who's a member of this household, who resides here, and asks people to define and bound in very particular ways, who is a part of their kin network and their, res their physical residence, and, and maybe uh, in ways that people wouldn't necessarily always um, define in that structured way or think about all the time. And so I do wonder how much that kind of, those kinds of constant surveys reshape the way that people define their own their own social networks at the smaller scale of, of a household or a family and at, at kind of broader scales as well. Um, it's, not a, it's not an easy question to answer, but there's clearly some sort of uh, feedback loop going on there. Um, but it's something I'm very interested in in my research. Uh, other work I'm doing is thinking about the ways that the kind of conceptions of family and household uh, get deployed and, and engaged in, in the context of, of demographic research, and that, that ties to that question in, in a different way. Um, Justin, how, how these clusters worked, how much the kind of engineering behind the clusters, it's, 
it's been an interesting process to observe over time. Um, I I started working on the, the trial here in the Western Cape later in its process, so I wasn't around when they mm -hmm. were doing this kind of work of defining the clusters and engaging the community. Um, at, at this, the trial site in Cosa de Tala was in, around from the time they were started, right when they were writing the protocol, and there was quite a lot of debate about how how these clusters would, would clusters would be defined. They used a lot of GIS technology, technology, so they did these self-report surveys a long time ago, actually in in the late '90s when they were setting up the center. So the, the those self-report surveys were done for the purposes of the demographic surveillance site, not for the purposes of this trial. So the, one of the reasons that a lot of work like these trials happen at, at this site and at other demographic surveillance sites all over Africa is you have this kind of, done. you have this work that's already been done in this, ima this imagined stable community, right, that you can then roll out a whole series of different kinds of trials and uh, pilot studies in, in this, this area where you already have a huge amount of data on the population and longitudinal data uh, that, that gives you a lot of from a research perspective is, is really advantageous. And when I was doing my doctoral research, the reason that I located it here was because I also uh, had access to all of that information, which allowed me to, to ask very different kinds of questions than I would have if I had worked uh, in a different site in South Africa. Um, and there are lots of pros and cons of that, of course, right? The working in an in a, uh, area where a lot of research has been conducted. Um, so, so I think in, in that sense, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of Sort of engineering over time in, in different ways. Um, so those initial surveys in the late 90s and early 2000s asked people to self-report, define local areas, and and they all they have quite fixed names now in in the center's maps, um, and those maps are used in everyday practice by field workers when they go out to mm -hmm. to survey households to identify mm -hmm. where they're going. That kind Very of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, and then. Um, and then in, in the context of this trial, there was then a lot of mathematical modeling work. And this is where it gets really complicated. There was a lot of mathematical modeling done uh, to try to, based on the work that the center had already done on HIV transmission patterns in the area, to think about uh, how broad people's sexual networks were and to make an argument about this concern around contamination. So in the context of an HIV trial, not to get into the kind of big the science of it too much, contamination means people sleeping with someone who is in a different area to them. So if, if these people are getting HIV treatment immediately and these people aren't, which is what the intervention is testing, then people from here shouldn't be sleeping with people from here, or it dilutes the effects of the trial, the ability of the trial to show a difference between those areas. So it's a big concern, right? This definition of community in, is essential to whether or not this trial can show any sort of significant findings. Um, so that's why it's such a contested term and something that clearly the researchers have thought a lot about. Mm -hmm. Um, they also have used phylogenetic analysis to think about this question, so to look at actual patterns in um, using, so this is at the genetic level of the HIV virus, looking at this virus here looks like this virus over here, and so did this person infect this person in this area, right? And they, because they're, because they're, capt they're collecting blood samples from people in the area and they've done that over time, and those blood samples are linked to these bounded structures, they actually know there's a person in this household, in this building, who's infected with HIV, and this is their the genetic makeup of their HIV virus, and there's a person over here who's infected with HIV, and this is the genetic makeup of their virus, and they can tell the relationship between those. That's, that's the level at which the phylogenetic analysis allows you to ask these questions. So there's me as an ethnographer asking these kinds of questions, and at the same time, there's researchers doing this kind of phylogenetic analysis of the site, thinking about the way that something like sexual network functions at a very different level, which creates a really interesting kind of uh, epistemological tension. You know, there's obviously a lot of crime in these areas, and you know, the violent crimes towards women, you know, there's a sense of like, well, like knowing too much about, you know. No, no, so actually there's a there's a PhD student I'm working with there now um, whose, whose project is exactly on the, the ethical ramifications of these new phylogenetic technologies, because it's, it's really a brand new thing. They weren't able to do it until until very recently, um, and to do it at a at a population level is, is something quite relatively unprecedented, and there's a concern. I mean, HIV transmission isn't criminalized in South Africa in the way that it is in a place like the United States, but there's still a real concern about being able to know, which you can through phylogenetic yeah, data, yeah, yeah. who infected you with a good level of certainty, which is, which is quite, um, quite dangerous knowledge for, for 
a researcher to hold. And there's a lot done to protect people's confidentiality and to ensure that names are never attached to, to this kind of information. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a segue, but it's a, it's a big ethical debate. Um, so, so yeah, in, in this site, uh, it's quite a complicated set of layers. And very, very intelligent work has been done. And I don't mean to, when I raise these questions, I don't at all mean to discount the incredible sophistication of the ways in which the center has engaged this concept. Um, but, but still, ideas like a legitimate political authority or um, what, what that means are kind of somewhat undiscussed, even though you can look at these questions at a different kind of, from a different scientific view. Um, and in the context of the trial here in the Western Cape, uh, it's it's very much a concern that comes up in, in the everyday practices of the trial as well, um, which is Dylan's also working on, on this trial, so he might have encountered this. But um, but how, who who are the kind of key stakeholders, and which local politicians were were asked to serve on these committees, and which weren't uh, creates better or well not better, but creates higher or lower kind of success rates of the actual rollout in the context of the trial, as I'm sure you guys all know, mm -hmm. from, from doing this kind of work. So, uh, Stephen, it's, I mean, I guess we can always read everything as the anti-politics machine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, I mean, the, the relationship between these kinds of big transnational research projects and the state is a really complicated one. Um, and they are certainly not, uh, well, these two trials have very different relationships with the South African state or with the provincial government in the places where they work. Um, the trial in the Western Cape is much more explicitly working through the Western Cape Department of Health. Um, the trial is in the maybe a bit less, but they still have to work within these clinic systems and have particular relationships with the state. But they are not, they're not, they're not, they don't see themselves as the state, right? They see themselves as very independent actors. Um, and they're very which they vote in both contexts. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, the PIs of these trials, the primary investigators, are, are international researchers. There aren't many South Africans um, in the higher echelons of these um, but trials. But people not see this as a state? You know, this is just yes. a state. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in people's articulations, in the interviews that I've done, that, that's what it's concerned a lot. Um, but, I, but I think these trials are imagined to be much bigger than the South African state, right? They're imagined to be about global knowledge production, how would we define that? Very complicated tension. I, I don't know, it's a, it's a good question, I don't really know how to answer it um, very clearly. The, the, the citizenship question is something that um, I didn't really touch on so much in this presentation. It's something I've thought about more in other work um, and in the paper that I circulated for the reading group, um, I take it on kind of more directly. I, I don't find the kind of biological citizenship notions to be particularly useful in the place where I work. Um, or therapeutic citizenship. I um, the reason that one of the readings I circulated was by Susan Reynolds, Reynolds White, and I find her work to be somewhat more useful in these um, settings. She talks about clientship instead of citizenship, and the kind of mm -hmm. tensions around um, notions of it's similar to kind of Shula Marx's writing on dependence and patronage, but um, clientship is a different kind of register than citizenship and she are in, in Uganda and um, HIV research and treatment programs that she finds it to be a more useful terminology. It doesn't sit perfectly in the place where I work, but it's a little closer maybe than per, in this in the place where I worked primarily, which is in Finland and Scotland, in the kind of therapeutic citizenship program. Um, but it would be very different in the Western Cape, you know, so maybe, maybe the therapeutic citizenship concept works better in a place like uh, like Kailicha than it does in northeastern Kwazulu Natal. I don't know. It's a. It's a, it's a yeah, but yeah. I'm th I was thinking it's related to the first mm -hmm. question. If people see all of this and the people who are using, who are involved in this program, see it as the state, they happen to be international players involved, but it's really the state. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't written about that in the context of, of this child's work, but I wrote about it in the context of my work on vulnerable children and uh, the way that those programs unfolded. Um, and people certainly, people don't speak the language of citizenship that much, or they haven't in, in the interviews that I've had, but they speak they speak this kinship-based language quite a lot, which is why I picked those quotes. Um, the one quote I gave from the traditional uh, leader, they speak the language of kind of uh, fathers and caregivers quite a lot, um, which is which is actually, I, I wish Brian was still here, because he's written about this in his work as well, right? The, the, 
kind of the state as a proximate familial figure rather than the kind of big, uh, the big state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of that's the way I hear people talk about it more. Uh, did Wait. I miss any, Joanna? Just a quick follow-up question. Uh -huh. Sorry, um, this notion of trilobite genetic studies. Can you unpack it just briefly? Uh, Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? This, this notion of trilobite genetic studies. Can you just unpack it briefly? Uh huh. Explaining what they do. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll do my best. It's not my uh, <laughs> my area of expertise, but so the basic idea is that um, phylogenetic analysis looks looks at the structure of in this context of the, of the HIV virus itself, and can look, so, so phylogenetic analysis was initially used to look at the origins of HIV. So to try to answer questions like, where did HIV come from? Um, and the, the work that they were doing, these, these groups, um, who are quite international groups of, of scientists, um, were doing looking at blood sample stores from the 1970s until now, and, and doing these large maps of where, you know, because HIV is a virus, I guess the, the background is that HIV as a virus mutates very quickly, and so the genetic code of the virus changes quite fast, which is why you can get this level of detail of, of as because a, a virus that I have in my body will have a particular set of mutations that shape its genetic code, which will be completely different to the HIV virus in in my neighbors, you know, and then even more different to the HIV virus in someone in you know a different city. If we're assuming that sexual networks are spatial, which may be a false assumption. And then even more different to the HIV virus in this person in this other country, right? So you can see a kind of patterning, like like a social network, like a map that they can draw of of how these viruses move based on those mutation patterns. Does that make sense? But it's very it's very um, relatively new science to be able to do phylogenetic analysis of the virus at the level of of individual um, transmission. It, it it was initially done at the level of kind of the difference between these larger viral types between countries, um, but they're getting more and more sophisticated at, at doing it. And, and our, we have uh, colleagues at the Africa Center who do this work for we're very sophisticated um, researchers. And there are a lot of really interesting things that these phylogenetic analyses can answer. They're quite important. Uh, they allow us to ask, get, to ask and try to answer very different kinds of questions that, than we used to be able to about, about something like how does a virus actually move um, but they're also, as, as I said, filled, fraught with all these new ethical concerns. How do you spell phylo? P H Y L L O, genetic. Genetic. Yeah. Yes. Thomas has one L. Accountability structures. How global health intervention and research. Program. What is that? Joanne's question, which I've forgotten. No, Jerry asked it. I just oh, 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 oh. it. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry, Joanne. I loved it. <laughs> okay, extraction around trying so, to explain science. Right. My question is about how, what, it's sort of, it is about the relationship between the state and the center, mm -hmm. but it's specifically about the accountability mechanisms that exist that the center. Um, must comply with or not. Mm -hmm. So in South Africa, as I'm sure you know, there are constitutionally mandated um, participatory structures for the right. governance of health. Right. And I wasn't sure whether or not these are functioning in this area, and if they are, what is the relationship between them and the center? Or are there other kinds mm -hmm. of um, you know, relationships of, of accountability yeah. with between the center and in the, in the context of the Africa Center. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the kinds of rules around participatory governance of clinics and of, of health services are um, a, a completely different set of rules than the ones that govern um, participation in the context of global health research. There are international kinds of sets of guidelines about participation in health research that have been reified in part because, as a response to these kinds of HIV trials over the last 10 years and now kind of the level of the, U, the World Health Organization, UN, there are these sets of guidelines about um, good, good, there's one called good, Participa good participatory practice in global health research, and specifically a good participatory practice in HIV research that set a set of guidelines that these kinds of transnational research centers are expected to follow that mean that you have given kind of, if you follow this set of guidelines, then you have kind of ensured 
that the community voices are represented and that the research is more democratic. But oh, it's all the parallel to the but state structures. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's going to have to yeah. go into the reading group for this yeah. further discussion. We're 15 minutes over, at least. But yeah, it's so been a great, go. great session and a great discussion. And we'll continue it at 3 o'clock in, in the next room. Four or six. Four or six. Thank you very much.